Uh, we talked about the skeleton. So we talked about the bones, right? So now we know all the bones. Hopefully you have a pretty good idea of some of the names of those bone markings. Uh, some of the bone markings that we stressed a lot were the intersections between particular bones, right? Like anytime you have two bones touching each other, we kind of named uh, the structures that we're interacting. Uh, so now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what happens in addition to the actual bones themselves interacting. We're going to talk about some of the other structures and stuff like that associated with uh, these connection points between the bones. Okay. Now, oftentimes when people talk about or when people think about bones or they think about joints, they're only thinking about the joints that can move. They think about their shoulders or their fingers, their elbows all of those fun things. However, there are other types of joints. Those sutures that we looked at in the skull, what was the name of the suture that separates the left and right parietal bones? Anyone remember? Sagittal, very good, okay? So that is a connection point between a bone, right? So thus, that is the definition of a joint. Now, that joint is a little bit different from something like say our shoulder though, is it not? Okay, so those two things are different, both in structure and in function, okay? So when we're talking about joints, we can actually talk about them in either their structure or based on their function, okay? Now, based on structure, our three major divisions are fibrous, cartilaginous, or synovial. Fibrous, cartilaginous, or synovial. These are structural classifications, okay? Now, uh, a fibrous joint is simply one where we have bone touching bone and they are held together by dense connective tissue, okay? So the stuff that is helping hold the bones together is dense connective tissue, that's it. So we have dense connective tissue, which we remember is fibrous in nature. So we have a bunch of cartilage fibers all running the same direction, okay? That's what's holding the bones together, which means this is going to be very, 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 very strong, okay? Now, a cartilaginous joint, what do you think is going to be holding the bones together in this case? We're going to have bone and then something else. Cartilage, exactly, right? Bone, cartilage, bone, okay? This is an example of a cartilaginous joint, okay? Where we have bones that are joined together by cartilage, okay? So it'll be bone, cartilage, bone. A good example of this would be something like, say, the connection point between our ribs and our sternum. We're going to go from bone to cartilage to bone. Okay. Now, uh, our next one is synovial. This one's a little bit harder to kind of wrap your head around uh, as far as just a structure. We're going to have some examples of this here in a minute. But a synovial joint is one where we have bone or bones that are joined together on either side of a cavity. Okay. We're going to call this a synovial cavity where we're going to go from bone. And then we're going to have a capsule around it that we're going to call a synovial capsule. Okay. Now, this capsule is going to be filled with fluid. Anyone want to guess what the name of this fluid might be? Very good. So we have a synovial capsule, and on the inside of it, we're going to have synovial fluid. Okay, so this is a synovial joint. We have fluid in here. Why do you think we might have fluid in between the bones? To lubricate it. Exactly. This is going to make sure that the two bones don't touch each other. And if the two bones aren't touching each other, because there's a thin layer of fluid in the way, that means there's no friction, which means things can move freely. So all of your freely movable joints, your fingers, your wrists, your elbows, your shoulders, all of those things, these are all examples of synovial joints. Okay, so we're going to have synovial cavities around each and every one of those. Now, you might imagine also, though, that say the synovial cavity between or the synovial uh, capsule and stuff like that with something like, say, a finger, is going to be a little bit less complicated than one around something like, say, your shoulder. And you would be correct, okay? 
So we're going to look at some simple ones, but then we're also going to look at some more complicated ones like the shoulders and the hips and the knee and stuff like that. Okay, but once again, these are all structural. It is a synovial joint because we have a synovial caps capsule and synovial fluid. These are structures. A cartilaginous joint, we're talking about it because it has cartilage at the intersection between the rib and the costal cartilage, okay? We have fibrous joints where we have bones that are joined by fibers, which are structures, okay? We can also talk about them based off of function. Functional classifications are simply meaning how much can they move, okay? So joints that move freely, okay? are called diarthrosis, okay? So diarthrosis simply means that we have a joint that is freely movable, okay? So your shoulders, your fingers, your elbows, all of these kinds of things are diarthroses. Amphiarthroses are simply going to be joints that are slightly movable, okay? So slightly movable. This is gonna be an example of something like, say, uh, your rib cage would be an example of an amphiarthrotic joint where we can move a little bit, but not a lot, okay? too much movement and you can mess with things, okay? Then finally, we get to synarthrosis. A synarthrosis is simply a joint that does not move. Anyone wanna guess an example of a joint that does not move? We've already talked about one. Exactly, the sutures of the skull. We don't want those to move, right? We have soft, squishy, gray stuff underneath that we need to protect. So we'd want those to stay as still as possible. So those are synarthrosis. Now we're gonna talk about some others as well. Now, uh, once again, we do want to highlight that we have to deal with this kind of range where on one side we, you can be stable, so stability, and on another side you can be mobile. Where these two things are opposed to one another. Every joint is going to fall somewhere along this line of leaning more towards mobility or more towards stability, okay? Mobility, if you are more mobile, that means you are typically going to be, well, synovial joints will be found over here, right? Synovial joints are going to be a little bit more mobile, as will, what's, anyone remember what the word was for freely movable? What was the word for freely movable? Diarthrosis. So our diarthrotic stuff is going to be over here on this mobility side of things. On the stable side of things, this is where you're going to find more of your amphiarthroses and your synarthroses, where synarthroses are really going to be all the way on this line because they will not move. Okay, so we are completely giving up mobility so that we can be as stable as we possibly can, okay? Now, fibrous joints. So all of these, uh, we're going to kind of start to break them down a little bit more. So first off, our fibrous joints. The first example of a fibrous joint we gave was a suture. Well, sutures are simply one of the groups of our fibrous joints. The other ones uh, are going to be either gomphoses or a syndesmosis, okay? So a gomphosis is, well, G for gums is the easiest way to remember this one. So just like your teeth, kind of, you know, the pink stuff underneath your teeth, uh, those are your gums, right? Well, the gomphoses are exactly where your teeth, where's my arrow? Your teeth meet your jawbone, okay? So this is either your mandible or your maxilla. And then your teeth fit into this. But we've also already talked about your teeth as being bones, or at least being very, very similar to bones, because we know enamel uh, had a whole lot more of the hydroxyapatite and less of the other stuff. Okay, that's why they get really hard. But the rest of your teeth are also composed of bone. Okay, so you have bone touching bone. Do we want our teeth to move within our jaw? Probably not. Okay, so this would be a synarthrosis, uh, but this is also going to help it be held in place by periodontal ligaments. So if you look at the picture here, you can see a bunch of little tiny lines connecting 
the bone to the root of the tooth, okay? These are going to be periodontal ligaments. Remember that ligaments connect bone to bone. So each and every one of these is a ligament that is connecting the bone of the tooth to the bone of the jaw, which means you get to be incredibly, incredibly strong, especially on things like our premolars and our molars, which have anywhere from two roots in our premolars all the way to three roots in our back molars, where they have three little prongs sticking down into the ends of our jaw so that these things get held in place no matter what. This is also why even if someone has a rotting tooth or like where the situation gets so bad that they have to have their teeth pulled so their teeth are that rotten and stuff like that, it is actually fairly common for all of that rotten stuff to mostly be up here and even down here. And it is still incredibly difficult to pull that out. As in you're using vice grip pliers with enough force that you can literally just break the tooth rather than it actually pulling out of the jaw, okay? Uh, very, 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 very strong. It does not want to give up. Now, another one of these though, that is a fibrous joint, are they going to be the syndesmosis? Anyone recognize these two bones? What are these? Radius and the ulna, okay? So this is the bones of our forearm, right? That antibrachial region. So these, are of course the bones of the forearm. These are held together by ligaments, okay? Tying the two bones together, making sure that they stay in this kind of configuration or helping stabilize them are going to be these syndesmoses. However, this is an amphiarthrotic joint. It allows some movement. Why do you think that this one might have to allow some movement? Exactly. We pronate and supinate our hands. And remember that the radius has to be able to kind of fold itself all the way around the ulna whenever we're doing that. So we have to have at least a little bit of movement be allowed by that syndesmosis. However, we don't want the bones to touch. So that's kind of what those uh, syndesmosis are actually trying to do. Now, cartilaginous joints. These are fun. This is where we have bones that are joined together by hyaline cartilage or fiber cartilage with no cavity in between them. So these are either going to be immobile or slightly mobile, okay? Uh, the ones that are slightly mobile or slightly movable <laughs> uh, are going to be our syntheses, which are over here. So where we have bone, cartilage pad, bone. So fibrocartilage pad in this case. So the, in between our vertebrae and also in between our two pubic bones. These are examples of joints that are going to allow a little bit of movement. Once again, your pubic symphysis is gonna move a little bit with every single step you take, okay? It has to kind of flex and move to allow the hip bones to flex and move. It can't be completely stable. Although it is incredibly stable, it still has to allow a little bit of movement. We have to allow for some play. Otherwise, it would just be really, really harsh on all the joints. Okay. Now, the same thing goes for in between our vertebrae. We know that we can move like our spinal column a little bit. We know that we can move those vertebrae somewhat. Okay. But we can't move them that much. Now, on the opposite side of things, where your ribs touch the costal cartilages, so say like right here, this joint does not move. The cartilage itself will move, and this joint right here will actually kind of flex a little bit, but the actual connection between the bone and the cartilage will not move. They are tied incredibly tightly together, okay? So this would be a synarthrotic joint between the bone and the actual costal cartilage. Now, when you breathe and it feels like your chest is expanding, what's actually happening is we're kind of stretching these cartilages a little bit rather than having the bone move on the cartilage. So that's what we mean when we say that it's not moving. It means that the bone is not moving away from or moving on the surface of the cartilage. It's actually, the cartilage itself is what's flexing the end you're doing that, okay? But that would be another example. Now, here is our synovial joint, okay? Uh, now, synovial joints are gonna have lots of different kind of classifications within synovial joints. You'll see things like ball and sockets and hinge and all kinds of fun stuff, okay? But all of them are going to, at their core, require a synovial capsule and its main layers, 
Uh, and then we have to have a synovial fluid on the inside. Now we are still going to protect the ends of these bones with a thin layer of hyaline cartilage. So we're just gonna kind of add to our picture here. So we're still going to protect the ends of the bones using a thin layer of hyaline cartilage. Now, one of the reasons that we're doing this is because now we can make this incredibly smooth. Cartilage is gonna be a lot smoother than even compact bone is. Uh, so now we have a really smooth surface that the fluid can really act as a nice barrier. So it's very, very difficult for us to get all that fluid out of the way, or at the very least, very difficult for us to generate any sort of friction, okay? Because we don't want friction. Friction is our enemy. Now, in addition to those, our synovial capsule has another layer to it, or it actually has two layers. We have a fibrous layer on the outside. And then we're going to have a very thin layer on the inside, which is the membranous layer. Okay. Or the synovial membrane is, I'll use the words that the book is using. But it is still a part of the synovial capsule, okay? That synovial membrane though is an epithelial tissue. Whereas the fibrous layer, well, it's fibrous, so this is gonna be dense connective tissue. But by using this thin layer of epithelial tissue, well, remember that we have linings and coverings, that's the job for epithelial tissues, right? But they also secrete. In this case, our synovial membrane is what's actually going to be secreting the synovial fluid, okay? So that synovial fluid is coming from our synovial membrane. And once again, this fluid is going to be there to act as a lubricant between the joints. However, something fun also happens with fluids, particularly water-based fluids. And that is namely that they cannot be compressed. Don't believe me? Watch a crane or a tractor move something that's incredibly heavy. They're doing that by applying pressure onto fluid. Hydraulics. They're trying to compress something that does not want to be compressed, and that allows them to basically ramp up how much pressure, how much force they can exert on something, okay? The same thing is gonna be going for our joints. By using this little bit of fluid, it makes it very, very difficult for us to get rid of this space so that virtually no matter what we do, there will be space between the bones, okay? Which means the two bones won't touch. However, sometimes weird things happen. Someone throws a basketball at you and you don't manage to get it onto the pads of your fingers. Instead, it hits the end of your finger while your finger is straight. That hurts. It's called jamming your finger, okay? Whenever you have jammed a joint, what you have done is you've positioned the bones in such a way where you've allowed it to push the water out of the way. You've pushed that synovial fluid out of the way and you've allowed these two cartilages to touch for just a second. They just go, Poop. but then everything gets awful, right? What happens to your joint after that's happened? It swells up, right? It swells up, you can't move it very well for a little bit, right? You start to get some inflammation. Well, that's because that fluid was right here, but then it got pushed out to the sides, which means it stretched our synovial capsule a little bit, okay? So we have to try and heal the damage that was done to the synovial capsule. But also these two things, these two surfaces touch, that hyaline cartilage touch, which means we also have to try and heal any damage that's been done to those as well, okay? Now, really, really bad cases this can happen, like where you can actually knock off bits of cartilage or even break the bones and stuff in between, but those are incredibly extreme circumstances. But for the most part, under ordinary circumstances, like I can do this right here, and I'm actually still, not worried about the fluid. It's still going to be there. It's only under weird circumstances that you end up with the situation of pushing that fluid out of the way and actually jamming the bones together and causing any sort of damage. Now, once again, uh, I do want to draw your attention to the fact that ligaments and tendons are different. Ligaments connect 
bone to bone. Tendons connect what to bone? Muscle, exactly. Tendons connect muscles to bones while ligaments connect bone to bone, okay? These are both going to be dense, regular connective tissue, which means we have collagen fibers all running parallel to one another. However, if y'all remember from looking at the connective tissues, were there a whole bunch of cells in dense, regular connective tissue? Was it very cellular? Were there very many fibroblasts? No, hardly any which means whenever a ligament or a tendon gets injured, it is going to take a long time to heal. Injuries in these kinds of tissues, because these are not very cellular, they do not have a massive amount of blood flow going to them, in part because there aren't that many cells there. Because of that, this can take a very, very long time to heal, okay? Now, the ligaments around a joint are going to be important to help us stabilize, strengthen, and reinforce the joints. Basically, that's to say that we keep the bones where they're supposed to be, and we keep the bones moving in the direction they're supposed to move. So we're trying to inhibit movement out of the ordinary, okay? A tendon is there simply to help us attach the muscle to the bone. However, these tendons can also be used to help us stay, or used to help stabilize the joints because they're still just connective tissues in and around the joints. Uh, and tension in a muscle can also help to stabilize a joint because like, hey, if we put some counter tension on something as it's trying to move, we can make sure that it's not going to move more than we're than it should, okay? Now, we also need to monitor what's happening in all of these joints, okay? We need to know exactly what is going on in these joints at all times. Because of that, we also are going to fill these with lots and lots and lots of sensory receptors. Uh, in tendons, we're going to call these tendon organs. Uh, but we also have some specialized sensory receptors uh, in the ligaments and stuff like that, which will be very important. Ah, wrong button. Now, we have a couple of extra little structures in here. They're going to be fun. Uh, first of these, we have a bursa. Uh, and then we're also going to see some fat pads in here as well. Uh, when it says fat pads, that's literally what it is. It is going to be adipose tissue that is acting as a pad. That's to say it is a protective acting. Okay. Uh, which is basically going to help make sure that things stay where they are and kind of fill some space to make sure that things don't end up in spaces uh, that things don't need to be in whenever we try and move in something like, say, a joint. We don't want a tendon or a muscle to get or a bone to go into a particular space so we can fill that space with a little bit of fat and all of a sudden nothing can really get in there. Okay. Now, a bursa is going to be basically a synovial capsule It's just kind of floating out in space. So instead of having a capsule just around the joint, not written, not, okay. Instead, it's going to be basically a little baggy that is filled with. Where did my blue marker go? In my pocket. Nope. Not me. Instead. It's basically this. It's basically a baggie that's filled with synovial fluid. It's a little fibrous bag filled with synovial fluid that we can use to take up space. And particularly because it's just a bag, like say I took a baggie and filled it with fluid or like say a water balloon and put some water in it. You can just roll that water balloon around on the floor all you want, right? Not really going to do much. The same thing goes for our bursa. These bursae, because they're basically just a bag of fluid, are able to move inside a joint. So whenever a bone goes to move and it pushes up against one of these bursa, the bursae are just going to move with the bone or move with the tendons. So this way we can kind of lubricate the interactions between something like a tendon and a bone with a bursa, and it will just kind of continue to kind of go with the flow of things rather than getting impinged or anything like that, okay? Uh, a tendon sheath is basically a bursa that's just longer. Uh, and let's go ahead and look at an example. Femur, tibia. This is your knee. This looks 
slightly more complicated than this. Does it not? A little bit more going on. However, it's still not that bad. We still have our fibrous capsule touching bone to bone, making our synovial cavity. Now, helping fill that synovial cavity or prevent some movement, we have a little fat pad here, uh, just both deep and distal to our patella. Okay. Well, we've also got this big tendon kind of running right past our patella down to our tibial tuberosity right here. Well, that's a big tendon that we don't want anything to happen to, like getting pinched in between our bones. We need it to be held in place. So we're just going to surround it by a bursa. So nothing happens to it. Now it can kind of move around as the bones are moving. The bursa is still going to protect that tendon, make sure that tendon does not get impinged. Okay. Now we also are going to see a little bursa back here deep to our gastrocnemius muscle, making sure that, well, our head of our calf muscle also does not get impinged by getting pinched in between these bones as these bones are moving. Because right now, this is with the leg extended, right? And so with the leg straight out. If the leg were to be bent, well, this bone would be way up here and you could get some space right here. And we don't really want that muscle to kind of get stuck in between the bones. So we have a bursa right here to kind of protect the gastrocnemius muscle so it doesn't get in there, okay? Now, uh, your book goes into some examples of different synovial joints based off of their shape, okay? Uh, we have plane joints. These are basically joints that are going to move in one direction just by sliding. Uh, we've got hinge joints. Well, they're called hinge joints because they're going to work basically just like a hinge on a door. They will move in one axis of movement. Just like a door is only going to move along that one axis, the hinge joint will also only move like a one axis, okay? You have a convex surface on one and a concave depression on the other, which is basically going to allow to act as a hinge. Good example of this would be something like, say, the occipital condyles of the skull and our atlas vertebrae. Remember that that atlas vertebrae is the one that allows us to nod our head. That is the only direction that that joint allows is us to nod our head. If we need to turn our head at all, now we have to have two other things interact. In this case, it would be atlas and axis, okay? A pivot is simply going to be kind of a pivot. That's really all it is. You're gonna have one bone that has a rounded surface, and then there's going to be a little ligament ring that's gonna wrap around it to make sure that we can just kind of swing it around. Good example of this would be like the head of the radius, okay? So between the head of the radius and the ulna, where it can kind of just swing, uh, that would be an example of a pivot or so allowing that rotation there. All right, a condylar joint. Okay, this basically means that we have those condyles, this kind of rounded depressions, right? Uh, then we're going to have saddle joints, uh, where if you kind of can picture a saddle in your mind where you have something that's kind of rounded this way, but also if you were to look at it from the other direction, would still be rounded that way. So it's kind of rounded in two directions. Uh, or I guess if you looked at a saddle, it would be rounded both side to side like this, but from the front, it would actually be kind of rounded like that. Okay? Because you have to have somewhere to sit, right? Uh, that would be an example of a saddle. Uh, we're going to see some of these in like in the ends of our, like in our bones of our fingers uh, so that we can get a little bit of bend. And then we're going to see ball and sockets. So your ball and sockets are going to be things like your shoulder and your hip. That's probably the most obvious of all of these. But these are all going to allow some either types of angular, rotational, gliding, or some special stuff that we're going to talk about. All right. Now, our angular movements are not the most important, but probably the most common. Most movements are going to fall kind of along these lines. Okay. All right. The movements that we're going to allow are the first ones we're going to talk about are flexion and extension. This is very simply increasing or decreasing the angle of the joint. Increasing the angle of a joint. So right now, the joint that we're talking about will be my elbow here, right? Right now, that joint is at roughly 30 degrees, okay? Going from 30 to 180, that is increasing the angle, right? That is extension. So increasing the angle of the joint, so increasing the angle between the bones is extension. Decreasing the angle of the joint is going to be flexion. That's it. Don't make this complicated, okay? Now, to further make things easier, 
this movement will, or flexion will always be anterior. Okay, so flexion at my hip. So if I flex at my hip, well, I'm bringing my leg anterior. That is flexion. The only joint where we will have flexion be opposite of that will be at our knee. Okay, your knee will flex posteriorly. Okay, because we, well, that's the direction our knee bends, right? So, but that is still decreasing the angle between the two bones. We're just kind of changing our perspective in this one case. But other than that, so say I lift my arms forward. Well, that is flexion at, at my shoulder joint, right? Flexion at my shoulder. This would be extension at my shoulder. Flexion at my hip. Extension at my hip. And so on and so on and so on. Flexion at my elbow. Extension at my elbow. And so on and so on. Same thing goes for your wrist. Okay? So flexion at your wrist is going to be basically lifting your palms up. Flexion of your digits would be lifting your fingers forward. This is going to be really convenient because many of our muscles are going to tell you what they do. For instance, flexion at your wrist takes place with two muscles, the flexor carpi radialis and flexor carpi ulnaris. Well, based off of what you should already be thinking about, based off of their names, not only does it tell you what they do, so what surface of the arm do you think they're going to be on? Do you think they're going to be on the anterior surface of your arm or the posterior surface of your arm if they are flexing your wrist, considering that muscles only pull? So if flexion is bringing it anterior, right, it's going to be on the anterior surface. Okay? Now, uh, radialis and ulnaris just tells you which side they're on, right? Ulnaris would be medial, radialis would be lateral. Okay, and that would help you find those muscles. So we're going to use this word a lot in helping us name things, but we can also use it to help us kind of figure out what is going on at various joints. Okay, now when we say something has hyperextended, this means not that we have gone past 180 degrees. It simply means that we have gone beyond our normal range of motion. Okay, so my normal range of motion for my elbow is right here. Okay at roughly 180 degrees. Hyperextension is to take it and bend it that little bit extra. In this case, it's maybe five degrees, okay? Uh, anything beyond that, and you start to risk mechanical failure of some sort of part, okay? Uh, so hyperextension is simply going beyond a normal range of motion. Some people will have larger ranges of hyperextension that their joints will allow than others, okay? That does not mean they are double jointed. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, it just simply means that their joints allow for a wider range of motion or that they can hyperextend some joints more than other folks. Now, we also will have lateral flexion, okay? And so lateral flexion would be here. So I'm flexing on the right-hand side of my body, while in this case, my left-hand side would be extending. Lateral extension in this case would be simply bringing myself back up to normal, okay? That one's fairly self-explanatory. All right, abduction and adduction are also fun, okay? Abduction is movement away from the midline. So away from the midline, away from the midline. So opening your fingers up is away from the midline. Bringing them back together is adduction. Okay, there's an easy way to remember this though. My arm is being abducted by aliens, okay? If it gets beamed up by Scotty, it is being abducted, right? It is being taken away. When I bring it back, I am adding it back to the middle, okay? So adduction is bringing it back to the middle. Abduction is it being taken away, okay? So abduction in my shoulder, abduction in my fingers, and so on and so on. Same goes with our hips. So abduction, adduction. All right, circumduction and rotation are two things that actually get somewhat confused for folks. Circumduction is where you're going to have different or in this case, the distal end of an appendage moves in a circular motion, okay? But the proximal end will stay mostly stationary. So right now, I'm making a circle, let me get where the people online can see, I'm making a circle with my hand, right? So I'm making a circle with my hand, thus circumduction, but my shoulder joint is staying relatively stable, okay? So you're basically making a cone. Okay, so if you can picture a cone in space filling what is happening with the movement, that is going to be a circumduction. 
rotation is movement along a longitudinal axis. Okay, so now I am rotating at my shoulder, right? See how everything is staying in the same line? Everything is staying in the same plane? This is rotation. This is circumduction. Okay, now we have different types of rotation. We, of course, have rotation of our head. We'll have lateral rotation, which is kind of bringing your arm out. Medial rotation, which would be something like bringing your arm back in, and so on and so on. Uh, lateral medial rotation of our legs, hands. Now, in our hands, uh, we're going to call it pronation uh, and supination. When we're talking particularly about the intersection at our elbow joint, okay? Uh, otherwise, we kind of have medial and lateral rotation at our shoulder. Uh, but pronation is going to be bringing your palms down. Supination is going to be bringing your palms back forward, okay? Where you're basically uh, imagining where your hand is laying down on its back. Okay. Whereas if you're laying down prone, it means you're on your belly. So pronation is bringing the kind of belly side of your hands down. Supination is putting the back of your hands facing down. And we're going to have special muscles that will do that, which are also going to be conveniently called pronators and supinators. Now, we've also got dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Uh, this is our next set of opposites. So uh, if any of you have ever played sports, you've been told to plant your feet. Okay. That means to point your toes into the ground, okay? So like if you're planting a seed, you're trying to push that seed down with your toes, okay? That is plantar flexion. So pointing your toes down to the floor is plantar flexion. Lifting your toes up is dorsiflexion. Eversion and inversion is something that we don't want happening beyond a very small set of movements, okay? Uh, eversion is where your little toe comes out. Inversion is where your big toe comes in, okay? So uh, inversion is with your big toe coming in, eversion is with your little toe going out, okay? Uh, both of these we are trying to limit as much as we possibly can. Uh, remember that the talus has that kind of nice little uh, inverse rocking chair shape on it. Uh, and the same thing goes with uh, the tibia. And then we have the medial malleolus on the inside and the lateral malleolus on the outside there to keep this from happening, okay? because we want that joint to be as stable as possible and keep going in a straight line as much as possible. We have to allow for some movement because we are moving lots and lots of weight around. Because of it, like to do something like this, I'm having to put 200 pounds of force onto each of my ankles and that force has to stop. And it takes a moment for that force to stop, which means we have to have a little bit of flexibility in our ankles just so that we don't run into a hard stop and things just break we have to be able to slow that motion down. That's kind of where this inversion and the eversion comes from. And while we have to allow some of it, otherwise it would just break if we met some sort of stress point. But by allowing this, we can allow at least some amount of movement here, but we don't want it to happen very much. Uh, we also have one fun thing that our hands can do that not everything can, and that is opposition. Uh, we can oppose, so move our thumb opposite of that of our other fingers, okay? So we can bring our thumb and pinkies together, which is nice and fun. Uh, not everybody has, or not every animal can do that. That makes it really easy for us to grab stuff. All right, so now let's go ahead and look at some joints. Okay, so here we have the shoulder joint. So the glenohumeral joint. However, that is also ignoring one important thing and that is also that we have the clavicle which is here meeting the acromion process which is here that part has to be there and has to be structurally sound so that we can limit how much the scapula is going to move to allow us to move our shoulder correctly now we've got a big bursa here makes a lot of sense since we can lift our arms right we don't want things to get impinged there so we have to have this big bursa uh, on top of the head of the humerus so it doesn't get stuck. And then we're also going to see a nice little tendon sheath wrapping around our biceps femoris tendon. So this tendon is gonna go down here to our biceps, not femoris, biceps brachii, okay? Uh, so the large muscle of our anterior arm. This is one of the two tendons, got two. But we wanna make sure it stays protected so it's wrapped in a little bursa. We've also got some ligaments here that are connecting the humerus to 
this flat structure on the scapula. Anyone remember what that flat structure on the scapula was that interacts with the head of the humerus? Do you remember what that was called? Starts with a G. Perfect. It's the glenoid cavity. That glenoid cavity and the humerus, thus glenohumeral, these are the glenohumeral ligaments because we are connecting the glenoid cavity, which is bone, to the humerus, which is bone, thus it's a ligament, right? So these are the glenohumeral ligaments. Oh, I just forgot that we took that off the list, so you don't even have to know those. Damn it. It's no fun. All right. Now, if we were to add an extra layer of connective tissue in here and start to add some muscles and stuff, we can see those glenohumeral ligaments here. We can also see our glenoid cavity. Around the glenoid cavity, you're going to see this little line. This little line of cartilage. It's also right here. What this is going to do, so say we've got, what color was bone? Purple? Say we have our surface of our bone right here. Well, we want to add as much mobility, or we want as much mobility as we can possibly get. However, we don't want it to move so much that the head of the humerus can come away from the glenoid cavity. We don't want to dislocate our shoulders. We want to hold it in place, okay? So what we are gonna do then, but we also know that our shoulder joint is every now and then going to be stretched to large degrees. We don't want this connection to be bone. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to strengthen that or deepen it just a little bit using our cartilage. But this little extension of cartilage right here, and I'm drawing it, I'm exaggerating it, okay? It's not very big. If you look on the screen, not very big. Uh, but by exaggerating this point just a little bit, what we're doing is we are strengthening our connection site between our scapula and our humerus, which is here, okay? We are deepening the joint. We're doing this with our labrum. If you've ever heard of someone saying that they have a torn labrum, what it means is this little extension of the glenoid cavity uh, is, like I said, it's cartilage. So we're basically extending our glenoid cavity a little bit with this little bit of extra cartilage so that we can deepen this interaction just a little bit so that we can add just a little bit more stability to the joint. And it hangs off the edges just a little bit. However, say I take this bone, this humerus right here, and I jam it up real hard where this bone touches this. Sometimes fun things happen when this bone comes up here and it grabs that or pushes against it. Namely that this part can shear off. Now you have this little bit of cartilaginous debris hanging out in the joint. That's fun. Sometimes it'll even come and hang out down here and get in the way of the head of the humerus. That's, that's real bad like real bad, because now you have a hard structure in between these two things where there shouldn't be any hard structures. But also, you don't have this little bit of strengthening bit here. This is someone that has torn their leg. Okay? Now, sometimes, though, it's just like a little crack. So in some case, it'll just simply be like, oh, yeah, no, I, I cracked a little. Basically, I pushed up against it, and it kind of bent. Okay? So it loses some strength. But that's different than it just kind of shearing off. But sometimes it does just shear off. This is also why it's very important if you ever do dislocate your shoulder to not put it back in yourself. To have an actual doctor do it while they're looking at a screen or at least while they're feeling where everything is supposed to be. Because it's really common for people to mess up the inferior portion of their glenoid labrum. Uh, because whenever they go to slide it back in, they're just going to push it up in from the bottom. And when that happens, oftentimes they'll clip off that little bit right there and damage the shoulder joint forever. But once again, cartilage. Cartilage doesn't heal very well. 
And when this happens, your shoulder is just not going to be as good as it used to be. Uh, it will heal somewhat, but it will never go back to the way it was before the injury. Very, very, very few things are able to heal and go back to exactly the way they were before. Instead, this will get replaced with some fibrous tissue rather than actual cartilage. And those fibers may not be going in the same direction as the cartilage, nor have as much flexibility and give to them, which means it'll be a slightly harder portion of the labrum. And also, usually it'll be slightly all out, out of size, uh, like it'll be like a little bump or something like that. Now, it will still work. You could still throw a baseball or something like that. Uh, but you might be more subject to feeling pain doing that or not be able to do it as much or something like that. And like I said, this is the glenoid labrum in particular. So these little extensions on the ends of the bone are called labrums. This one, because it's in our uh, on our glenoid cavity, this one would be the glenoid labrum. Now, our elbow is also quite fun, uh, in part because we basically now added an extra bone. Instead of just having one joint uh, or one or two bones coming together, now we've added a third bone, namely that of our radius here, okay? Now, one of the first things I wanna draw your attention to is actually going to be this annular ligament. This annular ligament is going to wrap around the head of the radius so that it can spin on the surface of the ulna because we have to have the radius be able to turn on the ulna. So this is gonna be our annular ligament, okay? We can also see this little guy right here, or these two guys right here. These are the ulnar collateral ligaments, okay? So we have a radial collateral ligament on this side. If I can find it, ah, over here. All right, so we have our radial collateral ligament here, basically tying the uh, humerus to the radius. We're also going to have the ulnar collateral ligament tying the ulna to the humerus. Uh, if you've ever heard of someone having Tommy John surgery, the reason they had Tommy John surgery is because they threw a curveball and broke, ah, actually they threw probably hundreds or thousands of them, but they tore this. This structure right here got broken. It shears because of the amount of force that they're applying, particularly at that joint. That's because to appropriately throw or to throw one well, like if you actually watch a pitcher's arm as they are trying to throw particularly a curveball, they are trying to make this joint at their elbow move not in one plane, okay? Remember that our elbow, like we even have that little line in the trochlea and on the ulna so that our ulna only moves in one direction, they are trying to force it to move a different direction than just that. They're trying to make it move sideways as well, making it act more like a shoulder. So they're applying massive amounts of force with the muscles of their arm. When they do that, that's going to, of course, cause some stretch right here. If they do it too much, that will shear, at which point, they can't throw anymore because, well, every time you go to throw, you're going to put some tension there. However, back in the day, uh, they would just come in here and replace it with a bit of the same type of connective tissue and everything was fine. They time together and like, okay, yeah, they can throw, but they won't be able to throw as well as they used to before. So then some doctors later on were like, hey, why don't we grab some ligaments from the legs instead? So then they started replacing the torn ligament with some ligaments from a cadaveric leg, which was under more stress, right? Which all of a sudden means this one is now stronger. That's why nowadays, whenever pitchers have Tommy John surgery, they can come back and they can throw better than they did before. And that's simply because now they can put more force onto their ulnar collateral ligaments than they were able to before because the ligament is now bigger and stronger than the one that they were born with and that they trained up. Uh, so yeah, turns out that having surgery can make you slightly better, but only in very, very, very particular circumstances. However, this is actually, this is true for a lot of people. And you can look at a lot of modern pitchers that have had Tommy John surgery coming back and they're, they're able to put more force when they're throwing their breaking pitches and stuff like that. So they do get actually physically better.
Uh, that started happening tip, uh, around the year 2000, maybe the year 2005, is when you started to see pitchers come out even stronger. All right, so we're going to see the same type of stuff in our hip. Uh, here we have our acetabular labrum, making this joint even deeper. Uh, to further strengthen our hip joint, we have this special structure right here, which is the ligament of the end of the femur. Uh, this is going to fit in the fovea capitis, which is that little hole uh, that was on the head of the femur. Now, once again, we still have lots and lots of uh, articular capsule in here. Notice how deep this joint is. Uh, has anyone ever heard, uh, uh, who in here has dislocated his shoulder? Is it just me? Okay. Uh, if there were more people in here, at least one other person would be, because one person would have done stupid stuff like I did. Anyway, uh, shoulder dislocations are actually fairly common. You can have them and nothing really bad all happens. Like I can still pick up a ball and throw it and do all kinds. Of, I can still do pull-ups and all kinds of fun stuff. Okay. Uh, not necessarily the case with a dislocated hip. Have any of you ever dislocated a hip? Do you even know of anybody that has dislocated a hip? Yep. It would be your grandparents. It is either someone that is old or someone that has been in a car accident. Those are the only times that you're going to hear about someone dislocating their hip because it takes ridiculous amounts of force to pull the head of the femur out of the acetabulum, okay? Also, when that happens, really bad things have to happen. You have to have a surgery to put it back. Uh, sometimes they will just replace the structures, it, especially if this happens to an old, like someone 60s or older, they'll just cut off the head of the femur and put a new one on and then put a new acetabulum in for you uh, just because that is how much damage you have likely incurred in the process. Or if it happens to someone that is younger than that, you just don't run very well or walk very well for the rest of your life. Uh, this did actually happen. So there was a famous football player and baseball player named Bo Jackson that this actually happened to. Uh, when I say famous, I mean, he was the best football player in football, so a pro bowl football player, uh, all pro, whatever. Uh, and he was also an all-star baseball player. So one of the best at both sports at the same time, which is very, very difficult to do. He's just an incredible athlete. He's like 6'5", 230 or whatever when he was playing baseball and football. He'd get a little bulkier. He would bulk up for football season. But – very, very big, incredibly strong, incredibly fast. Like there's videos of him like literally running up balls like he's a ninja, like going up to catch a ball or whatever. Uh, crazy athlete gets tackled one day and out of bounds. Like he gets hit on the edge of the sideline and the player continues the tackle, but he has him by his leg and basically grabs it by his leg. And that's how he pushes him out of bounds. But then he lifts him up and lands it right on his hip. And it just so happens that he landed correctly enough that he was able to dislocate his hip. Both careers were ended right then. Never played baseball again, never played football again, just simply because he wasn't able to get back to being that fast or that strong ever. He only got to do that kind of stuff for like four or five years before his career got ended by a tackle because he dislocated his hip. Crazy. We don't do that. Your hip is very important. Also very important is your knee. Don't believe me? Look at all the things that are labeled on this figure. There are lots and lots and lots of structures in your knee. This is just the exterior view, okay? So here we have a ligament that is connecting our tibia to our femur. So we have our tibial collateral ligament or our uh, medial collateral ligament. We have our lateral collateral ligament or our fibular collateral ligament connecting our fibula to our femur. Uh, we're also going to have some structures in the back here. Uh, namely, this is our popliteal ligament because remember the back of our knee is that popliteal region. When we remove the exterior structures, we can also see some other fun things. Namely, that we've got these two cartilaginous pads right here that are also very large. These are made out of fiber cartilage, just like in our in intervertebral discs. These are gonna be called our medial and lateral meniscus, okay? We have the medial meniscus here and our lateral meniscus here. These are basically gonna be these half moon shaped 
structures of cartilage. Okay, so they're going to look something kind of like this. Okay. And they're going to be concave uh, on the top, and they'll be convex on the uh, So they're going to be concave on the upper surface or the proximal surface so that they'll fit with the convex nature of our lateral and medial condyles. But basically what these are here to do is these are here to deepen the outside of your knee. Notice that they are taller, that the menisci are taller on the outside. That's because we are trying to limit side to side motion of the knee. We do not want the knee to move left and right. We want the knee to move front and back, okay? If it moves left to right, which it will do a little bit, we want to limit that motion as much as possible. So we're going to build up the outsides of these menisci so that we can keep the move, the plane of the movement as front to back as is possible, okay? While cushioning any side to side movement that may occur. Now, you're also going to see a couple of what we call cruciate ligaments, okay? So cruciate means that we are making an X, that they are crossing each other. One of these is going to be more visible from the front. This is the anterior cruciate ligament. The other one is going to be more visible from the back. In this case, we can't even see the front one. This is our posterior cruciate ligament. Your ACL is here. Your PCL is here. It's also here, okay? These are here to prevent twist of the bone. We especially, like if we don't want the bone moving left, the whole bone to move left from right, we damn sure don't want it to try and twist. Okay, twisting means it's going to be pushing against these edges. It's going to be pushing against the rest of the joints. We don't want that to happen. So we've got some ligaments in here to help prevent that from occurring. And the posterior and anterior are at right angles to another, kind of making a little cross. So this way they can prevent both uh, clockwise twist and counterclockwise twist. Okay, however, say you are running with a football in your hand and you have planted your leg. Okay, you've put most of your weight on this one side while your leg is usually slightly bent okay by slightly bending your leg you are kind of like this person is here so this leg is fully bent but just undo it a little bit by doing that though you're putting a little bit of strain on these because these are going to follow the joint okay but then say someone hits your knee while your knee is slightly bent and all those things are exposed so now they hit it at say a right angle to one of those ligaments. Well, fun things happen for you. Namely that these two things, which are trying to prevent twist, can't anymore because they're already under strain. You've already kind of maxed out how much strain they can be put under because by planting your leg and trying to turn at the same time, you are twisting at that joint. So you're already putting them under strain and you're getting close to maximizing how much strain they can be placed under. And then when someone hits it in an opposite direction, they simply can't take the amount of force that's being applied through them anymore, and they break. If you're in a basketball stadium that is not completely full and where never but every single person in there is not screaming, so say less than 10,000 people are yelling, you can hear it. I actually got to hear someone tear their ACL one day playing basketball. I was like 30 rows back, and it was like, oh, this is bad. because of all the attention that was placed in China. And then you can't run for a year because it's a ligament, which means we don't have blood flow. If you've ever wondered why it takes so long for people to come back from these injuries, it is simply because it's connective tissue. It does not have a lot of cells, which means it does not get a lot of blood flow, which means it doesn't heal very well. It can take six, eight months just to have the ligaments fuse back together. Then you have to rehab all of the muscles to try and get the muscle strength back to where it was before the injury. Then you can start playing in. So that usually means you're out for about a calendar year. Some people it's faster. Uh, age also varies a lot. If this happens to a 19 year old, uh, they might be able to play the next year and be fine and everything's okay. If this happens to Tom Brady at 43, well, good luck. We have seen the last of it, okay? So age is also a big factor here, but that's why it takes so long.
All right. Uh, we also have some fun stuff in our ankle. I just wanted to show you how complicated your things like your foot and your wrist and stuff can be. Look at all these ligaments here, connecting all of our uh, tarsals. There's just a lot going on. Okay, same thing. It would look the same in our wrist. Uh, but I just kind of wanted to show you this. I'm not. I'm not going to ask you any of these. Like I'm not going to point at this structure and say, "What is this?" Because that would be me. Okay. Uh, you do have a list of structures uh, in your outline for the chapter. Go through that. Uh, label all the parts and pieces that you need to be able to label. If you want to pull out the bone boxes and put some of these bones together and kind of look at the structures that are interacting with one another, great. That's totally fine. Uh, we also have some joint models uh, back there as well. We have one for the elbow, the knee, the hip, and the shoulder. Uh, so yeah, label the parts and pieces that you need to label. If you, like we have plenty of time, we still have like an hour left of class. Uh, actually, hold on, it's like 11. Yeah, so we have an hour left of class. Uh, you can even pull out skulls and label those things. So now just kind of use this as study time. Everybody good? All right, let's get to it. Uh, no, there's one in the library. Hmm. So, what? Okay, how does a printer help? I can give you a power cord. Oh, yeah. No. Also, one last. But I can pull up the outline. <laughs> if that's the main thing that you need in. You remember on the first day of school, right? Like, say we did a function of the butt class. Uh huh. And then uh, I did finish it, and then I went home and tried to finish it, and then I started six when it goes. Okay, I'll, yep, yeah, okay, I'll fix it. I emailed the butt. Oh, did I not fix it? I usually, like, after people email me, I usually, that, that's usually what it takes to make me fix something. Okay, I'll fix it. We'll have fun with that. Mm -hmm. Yep, and it will work exactly the same way. See you next week. There you go. Mm -hmm. There you go. Uh, online people, do y'all have any questions for me? No, sir, I'm all good. Awesome. This right here is something to support. What's up? Okay. 